let's talk about now the hard way, and I, I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek, to work with variables using C Sharp. I call it the hard way because it takes a lot more code. It takes a whole two more lines of code to do this than it does using it the way we did in the previous video. Whew, that's hard. Two more lines of code? <laughs> All right, I'm being a little simplistic. Maybe it's three lines of code. Maybe it's five. But I have to do more thought process to do it this way. However, that's my opinion. I think it's the hard way. I know many other SSIS developers who think it's the easier way, who prefer it this way. Does it matter? Not really. There is no performance difference between the way I just showed you in the last video and the way I'm about to show you. The only difference is one of concurrency at what point do you lock and one of code management. Which do you think is easier to manage? Let me jump in here and show you what I mean. Let's create ourselves another package. We'll create, I should have just kept that same one, but I didn't. I try to keep the videos modular so that you can get everything you need in one video. So let's make a remote file name. Let's make it a strang. That's how we said it in Mississippi where I grew up. And we'll, uh, we'll make it uh, something like this. I just put up a new website, and so we'll make it that. I guess that's the file name. I don't, don't even know. Uh, so we've got ourselves a variable. And I showed you how to use the script task in the last video. We grab it. We choose C Sharp, right? You bring it in. I'm just going to blow through this because we just spent... 10 minutes doing it in the last video. Now you just grab a message box, show this. It's in the user namespace. Right, nothing fancy. Okay, and what actually is happening right now is right now, and I literally mean right now while it's showing me this little pop-up, our script task for the duration of the script task has locked the variable remote file name for read and that means that if we're in a parallel situation and what I mean by that is that multiple tasks can execute at the same time everybody can access this same variable if they are reading it multiple you can have many readers however no other task right now would be able to write to this particular variable because it is locked for reading. You see, when you put it into this read-only variables here, you are locking it so that you are the only task that, or, or you are blocking, if I did this, you are blocking parallel tasks that run at the same time. You're blocking them from writing to that variable. Okay? You've locked it for reading. If down here we had placed this into the read-write variables, we would be blocking other tasks from reading this variable. Uh, we, I'm not sure if you watch the VB section or not. I'm not sure, but I said uh, in that video that readers block writers and writers block readers. And that's just concurrency 101. That's just simply how... Um, concurrency works when it comes to applications, whether it be data, uh, databases, C Sharp, VB, it doesn't matter. If I am, if I place the remote file name right here and this becomes my variable, now no other task can read it while I have it locked for write. And they are blocked. They have to wait for me to unlock it. When you put your variables up here, you are locking them for the duration of the script task. Some people don't like that. Some people would like more control. They want to be more granular with their variables. So here's what they do. You can come down here and you can go to the edit script. Stop. Hold on, back up. Notice that I stripped it out. I am not locking anything anymore. So I come down here and I manually can lock my code down here. So this will now fail. Notice that I haven't changed any of my C sharp code. I'm referencing the variable remote file name, which we know exists. 
but if I take it out of the read only variables collection or the read write variables collection and we run this we're going to get a failure and when we go to the output we get some horrible error message here that just talks about I don't you know the element cannot be found in the collection okay that just means that you've got a variable name that it could not find you can tell it's a variable problem down here because here is the stack trace uh, you can see that it, when it was trying to get the variable it failed okay? so it was trying to get a value of a particular property and it could not so it failed now of course to fix it you know we could just simply put remote file name up here it locks it for read runs fine right okay let's do this actually declaratively so instead of letting the system manage this and be all fancy let's write it out ourselves let's go to the edit script now we have to lock this particular variable ourselves so get rid of all this junk down here now one of the things we have to do is we have to work with the variables collection here this is the variables class and so I'm gonna create a variable <laughs> Uh, called my vars and I'm going to make it empty so it's just going to be a null reference here so it's just not anything however it is of the variables type so I say okay I now want to use the variable dispenser so you might have seen this oh man it kind of shows up right there we've been using dts.variables and you might have wondered what the variable dispenser does well, it does what it suggests. Let's see, will it work? No, as soon as I hit control, it goes away. Um, if I bring the variable dispenser into play here, the variable dispenser has a bunch of... I wish I could make that zoom in. I can't do it, really. Okay, well, you're just going to have to see it like this. I apologize. What it's doing right here, we've got lock for read lock for write that's how we lock a variable okay and then I can lock one for read you see I can lock all variables for read or I can lock all variables for write or I can lock one particular variable for read or one for write so I'm gonna lock one for read you know the principle of concurrency never lock more than you need to right so lock one for read open it up it's a method which variable do you What's the variable name that you want to lock? Remote file name. Now, this is a reference variable, so you need to pass in the keyword ref, and you need to reference that. So now you can see we are taking and we're populating my vars with this particular variable. Okay. Now, now that you have locked that, this is the same thing as putting it into the read, the read variables collection. Now you can actually work with this. So now we can go back to our message box dot show, and I can say uh, I want to show my vars remote file name dot value. So notice that I'm using my vars. I'm not saying dts.variables. I am now I've made this is now dts.variables effectively. Now I have locked this variable, and my final step is to unlock the variable. And I have to use the unlock method. And this does the same thing. So you might want to take a just a second to look at this code. We start out with an empty variables, we then lock one for read. And then we show it and we unlock the variable. Very important step right here. We need to unlock it so that other tasks can use it. But you see, right now, once we've unlocked it, now I can go on and I can do all kinds of other things. I'm, not, I'm no longer locking this variable for the duration. I'm now just simply locking it here for that little bitty time. come back over here let's just run it make sure that I've got my code right and haven't messed something up works come back I'll show you some alternatives
what I would really do in the real world, if I really did lock this particular one for read, I would not retype it in here because I would use the indexer and I would just say, hey, the first variable in the collection. That way I'm only having to define my variable name one time. And in the real world, I'd probably have a variable that stored that. Um, I'd probably say, um, you know, like var which variable to use equals remote file name and then I would do that okay so that that makes a lot more sense I could even make that a constant uh, read only I static whatever you need to do here I probably would do it like that in the real world now, there are a couple of things that you have to worry about here. What if the variable is not found? Okay, now it's time to start thinking about bringing in a try catch. Okay, so now you could say, I want to do a try, and I'm going to try to lock this for read, and I'm going to try to show it. Um, if I have an exception, maybe I need to do something, you know, uh, Maybe I just need to rethrow the exception. I don't know. Uh, but what I want to finally do is so that I don't block the rest of my tasks, I finally want to unlock. And if you understand your try catch here, we're basically saying even if this fails, we've already locked this one for read. So if, if I have problems later on, I want to make sure that I unlock it. To extend this, and I'll finish. I'll finish this one. Okay, so what I've seen a lot of people do is instead of putting it like this, they will create other methods in their SSIS here. So they will say something like um, uh, get variable value. Okay. And, you know, we'll actually return an object here because we don't know what type it is. And you say string variable name. And now I would take all of my code down here. And so what's it telling me? I know it didn't return a value because I hadn't done that just yet. But now I would basically do the same thing. I would get my variables value. I'd say my vars. And now I'd just say let's try to get that bad boy. Let's get uh, lock one for read and I'd say um, I want to pass the variable name in here and place that into my vars sorry and now we want to unlock and so we'd say we want to return um, actually I need to unlock here um, so I'll just say object uh, return value down here and we'll say return value equals my vars and we'll grab the one right dot value and then we'll unlock it and now we just simply return return value so now I could just say get variable value up here instead of all of this fancy stuff here I could take this out and I could say get variable value which variable to use and so I would use this code down here now truthfully I do need to put in my try catch uh, you might have some optimizations you might want to work with integer variables uh, you don't maybe don't want to deal with boxing and unboxing that's kind of up to you how you want to work with that but this is a very reasonable thing you can do and once you have this code, you could just simply copy and paste that into a number of script tasks so that you simplify the access to the variables. Final thing. Let's come up here and let's change this lock one for read. Remember, there are actually two different ways we could do this. We have in our variable dispenser, we have lock one for read and lock for read. Okay. So notice when I lock for read, I can pass the name of the variable in here. Okay. Okay, so we lock it for read. However, if I actually want to get the value of it, 
now we actually have to reference it. So we have to use the get variables. Okay, so I now say this is a, a little bit more challenging. Okay, so we're, we've locked this one. And now we want to get the variables, put them into the variables collection. And now, instead of this, we'd be still able to do that. So lock one for read does all this in one step. Lock for read does it in two steps. Okay, really the same thing. There are, at least in my knowledge, there's really no effective other reason to do one or the other. They're basically going to do the exact same thing for you. Just need to make sure you unlock these at the end. Uh, there's, you know, the same thing. If you wanted to write, you know, you'd say lock for write. Okay. I don't think that we have to cover that. There's no difference between them. You just set the value instead of get the value. That's all you have to do.